All right, uh, we're continuing the NOMO West track. Uh, so uh, as part of the STF grant, uh, I was also working on integrating systemd homed into GNOME. Uh, so just a very quick summary of what HomeD is. Um, basically, it's uh, SystemD's uh, new way of managing your home directory. Uh, it comes with a bunch of benefits. It, it was added in version 245 back in 2020. Um, yeah, uh, by Leonard. So uh, probably the biggest benefit, the most obvious visible benefit is encryption. Uh, HomeD will encrypt your, your home directory per user uh, with the user's password, essentially, or a key derived from it. Um, so when you log in, it's no longer just a kind of surface level check if the password matches a hash and you get to go in. It actually decrypts all your data. Uh, and the other uh, trick, you may, you may be thinking, well, I have a laptop and it has one user on it and it's full disk encrypted, so what's the difference? Well, the difference is HomeD can actually erase the encryption key from the kernel's memory when the laptop goes to sleep. Uh, so actually all your data is uh, encrypted at rest again uh, when your laptop is sleeping rather than shut down, because no one ever shuts down their laptops, really, practically. Um, and there's some less obvious benefits, uh, portability. Uh, so traditional home directories and user, dev, like user accounts are spread across all these different databases all over your system. So you have varlib account service, uh, you have Etsy password, you have Etsy shadow, you have uh, others potentially. Um, so this is spread all over the place. Um, and HomeD puts all of it into one file inside of your home directory. So if the home directory exists, the user exists. Um, and this makes the home directory portable. It can actually move between uh, distributions. So in my earlier installer talk, I mentioned that maybe distributions can start sharing a slash home partition. Uh, HomeD allows that to happen. Because HomeD actually, uh, if the, I mean, if the folder is there, then the user exists. Uh, and this is done with uh, a JSON file, uh, storing all the user settings, which allows the third big benefit, uh, extensibility. Uh, the reason we have all these different databases is because they were written in the 80s or later, and they were not designed to be um, extended with new settings. Over, t over the last like 20 years, we added profile pictures and a real display name and a bunch of other fields we want to store. Uh, like your preferred desktop login session. Um, and every time we need to add something new, we had to create a new database. Well, it, since it's JSON, we just add a new standardized key to the JSON file, and there you go. Uh, and finally, fancy authentication. Uh, HomeD users, because they actually involve crypto, um, they can actually uh, do like FIDO, uh, like your YubiKey can actually decrypt your data. Uh, or um, PKCS11, uh, and eventually it will allow us to do things like a TPM with PIN, so uh, we could actually have secure PINs that uh, are resistant to uh, basically brute force attacks, um, and maybe one day, I hope, we can figure out how to do secure fingerprint sensors. So yeah, uh, uh, Leonard gave a talk about this back in 2019. It's like 40 minutes long. Uh, it goes into way more detail than I did here. So uh, uh, go watch it if interested. So if HomeD is so great, uh, why aren't we all using it yet? Uh, and the answer is uh, the desktop environments are a little behind the times. Uh, basically, uh, HomeD um, HomeD's core kind of feature, and that's where putting the laptop to sleep uh, removes the disk encryption, needs a collaboration from the desktop environment. Because uh, the desktop environment cannot continue running uh, with the encryption key missing. Uh, it might try to access a file and it'll get frozen by the kernel immediately. Uh, and if your desktop environment's frozen, you can't type in your password, you can't get back into your system, and essentially your session is gone. So the desktop environments need to start doing things like uh, actually switching back to the display manager to uh, prompt for re-authentication. Um, 
So this is what my kind of original mission was on, for the GNOME STF grant, was to implement this uh, functionality into GNOME. But as with many things, uh, it turned out we were missing um, some signaling in System D that would actually communicate to the desktop environment uh, what is uh, needed. Um, so the desktop environment actually doesn't get any warning that it's about to be frozen, so it doesn't have a chance to put itself on screen. Uh, put, put, uh, so in GNOME this would be GDM. So it doesn't have a chance to put GDM back on screen uh, to prompt you for your password. Um, so uh, the work ended up being uh, deeper in system D than originally intended. Uh, all right, so here's what's all been done. Uh, first of all, uh, session freezing. This has landed and been released in version 256. Uh, basically, when the key is removed, the kernel will freeze processes that try to hit the disk. But if you don't try to hit the disk, you don't get frozen. And this is very bad because then you get a session that's half frozen, half running. The running parts think that the frozen parts are frozen, which they are. Uh, so it will actually try to like terminate them or just disconnect them from the bus or whatever and your session just crashes horribly. So uh, we fix this by just freezing your session uh, when, uh, when we lock it. Blob directories. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, HomeD's configuration is in a JSON file. JSON does not store binary data very well. Um, so we had to come up with a way to store binary data because uh, things like your profile picture or uh, potentially even your wallpaper because we want the wallpaper to show up on the lock screen. Um, like these things are image files, they're binary files, so they're potentially very large. Uh, so we need to figure out how to do that. And blob directories were the answer. Basically now we have JSON and we have a folder next to the JSON with uh, uh, storing these files. And we hash them and we put the hashes in the JSON to make sure that we maintain all of uh, uh, HomeD's integrity verifications on all of its metadata. And HomeD then signs all of its metadata to make sure that it's all valid. Um, updates to records. Uh, so this JSON, HomeD was very protective of it. Uh, so you can't actually change anything about it without typing in the user's password, which uh, in theory sounds good, but in practice uh, the system administrator should be able to change user settings, like uh, set quotas and, and things like that, or forcibly, um, like, you know, set other restrictions basically. So uh, the reason HomeD wanted a password is because it actually needs to go inside of the home directory and uh, edit the file in the home directory. So we extended HomeD to uh, basically do that whenever it can. So actually it'll now store keys in the kernel key ring while the user's unlocked and use that to go in. But if the user is locked, it, it can't do this. So actually what we do now is we persist your settings uh, off to the side somewhere in var if, uh, if the user is not active. And the next time the user logs in, the settings are, uh, they're applied immediately by HomeD. So they're in effect from the beginning, but they're just uh, backed up inside of the home directory uh, at login time. So that also landed in version 256. Uh, and there's a second part to it where if an administrator can change settings, uh, a user should be able to change some of their own settings without entering a password. Uh, for example, um, like changing their, uh, sorry, without entering the administrator's password to, to, be, to be clear. Um, like changing some innocent things like their display name or their profile picture. Um, so we introduced an allow list of settings that a user is about to change about, allowed to change about themselves. And uh, this is configurable by the administrator, so uh, it, per user. So if you have a user that is misbehaving by, uh, you know, setting their display name to something inappropriate, you can actually prevent them from doing that. Um, but yeah, this is work in progress. This isn't merged yet, but uh, probably will be soon. Uh, all right, the plumbing. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, there was no signaling about, uh, no warning that you know this locking is about to happen. Uh, and uh, we ended up, I ended up putting all of this uh, plumbing into login D uh, and not directly into home D. And there's actually a benefit here that other um, user management solutions like maybe Realm D or Active Directory stuff or whatever fancy custom user management thing you want can actually integrate into this and it will integrate naturally into desktop environments 
uh, where uh, they will offer a secure lock, essentially, to um, basically revoke access to the home directory through whatever mechanism is available um, while the uh, laptop is suspended. So these patches are all work in progress and they probably still need more work before they can merge. Account service. Uh, if you're familiar with the way desktop environments handle users, uh, they use account service. Uh, this is kind of a temporary solution to the problem of having all these different user databases. Uh, it kind of aggregates all the data and adds its own user database, of course. Um, uh, account service is pretty deeply integrated into all the desktop environments. So my options were to rewrite lots of desktop environment components or teach account service to do HomeD. Uh, so for the short term, I decided to do the former. So account service now is aware of HomeD and will enumerate HomeD users. And if you tell account service to change settings, it'll actually change the settings in HomeD. Uh, so it's kind of the best of both worlds solution for now. And that is available in Git. So that will be uh, in the next account service release. And uh, uh, all the changes necessary in GNOME, in GDM, in uh, GNOME Shell, uh, pretty much all over the stack in GNOME. Um, I actually gave a version of this talk at Guadec where I, will go in, I go into a lot more detail about the GNOME specific things, but since this is not a GNOME conference, I, I won't bore you. Um, all right, instead, I wanna go into more detail about the actual uh, OS uh, level plumbing that would be, uh, uh, that we can have any chance of uh, solving. So first of all, Auto resizing. So the way HomeD, HomeD works is with uh, loopback files uh, with the Lux volumes inside of them. Uh, or at least that's the, the HomeD that we're interested in using. It has other modes too. Uh, but loopback files are a bit inconvenient because they have a fixed size and home directories don't generally have a fixed size. So uh, systemd sub supports this mode where uh, it actually will resize your home directories on the fly to kind of try and emulate the traditional situation where you have a slash home shared by many people. Um, but the way this works in practice, and it's kind of the best we can do with the kernel we have, um, is when you log in, it takes your home directory and it grows it to fill the disk. And when you log out, it essentially defragments the file system and shrinks it live before dismounting it. Uh, this has problems. Um, logging out might take in some situations, in some edge cases, most of the time it's fast and fine, but in some edge cases you'll end up uh, waiting for logout to happen for potentially unknown amounts of time. Um, and even worse, if your battery dies during this, uh, well then you're left with a home directory that is filling the disk and the only way to shrink it is to type in that user's password. So uh, we're kind of imagining a situation where maybe someone's laptop dies while they're logged in and then maybe their spouse takes the laptop to work the next day and then, oops, you can't log in because the home, the slash home directory is entirely filled with a user that's log, not logged in but they never got shrunk. Um, so uh, the GNOME designers kind of said, eh, no, we don't want this. So for the time being, GNOME actually uh, hid the option to create multiple users in the GUI. Uh, you can do it from the command line still, but if you open the GNOME settings app and say, I want to create a user, you'll actually get a warning basically saying, you're using, the, this feature isn't supported yet. Um, so potential solution to this that we've been discussing would require uh, kernel work. Uh, but basically, we're thinking of uh, maybe making the, the loopback file the size of the entire disk and making it sparse. Um, and the, you know, the usual issue with that is that uh, the file system inside of there will happily write past the end of the actual physical capacity of the disk and then bad things happen. So uh, we teach ButterFS to lie, um, basically. And it could detect the situation and uh, actually lie about the amount of free space it has. So, but the ButterFS in the big loopback file would have more space than it would report. 
it would report the actual real underlying free space of the file system that's underneath the loopback file. Now, th this idea, I'm not a file systems expert and definitely not in the kernel, so it seemed kind of, uh, was it feasible? I don't know. But uh, I did actually talk to some uh, uh, ButterFS people and they seem to think this is possible and this is actually uh, a solution that they independently converged on uh, and just happy we ended up happening to run into each other and talking about this. So maybe? Uh, but it needs kernel work uh, either way. All right, next. Uh, the kernel page cache uh, and uh, its effects on uh, key removal. Uh, basically, removing keys does not mean that your data is inaccessible. I mean, it mostly means that, but uh, if you were accessing encrypted files, uh, those files are still in the page cache. Um, so uh, we could try to fix this uh, by um, adding uh, basically an I.O. control that can say, hey, Linux kernel, uh, please discard all the page, cla all, all the page cache um, entries relating to this block device as if the block device was just unplugged. Uh, but then we run into a second issue, and this one's a little more insidious. Uh, removing something from the page cache doesn't actually zero out the memory underneath. So at that point, the kernel actually has completely lost track of uh, sensitive uh, file contents uh, that you have uh, in your memory. Um, so yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. There's mitigations for that, but they have uh, performance uh, um, issues that could potentially be uh, catastrophically large. I, I had a NVIDIA developer tell me that it's a very bad idea to turn on these mitigations, uh, something like 1,000 times performance degradation in the GPU driver. Um, and this, by the way, is not a problem with Home D. This is a problem even if you dismount. So if you have a USB stick with Lux, uh, and you plug it in and you copy, you read some data off of it and then you even dismount and remove the disk. The page cache entries are gone, but until they're overwritten by some other thing, uh, that data might still be in, uh, in uh, the, the RAM. So uh, if you really, really want to be paranoid, uh, shut off the computer um, after you remove very sensitive uh, disks. Uh, I think in practice, this isn't actually quite so huge of an issue. I mean, your home directory is going to be potentially dozens of gigabytes in size. Your RAM is not that big. You're not accessing all that many files. But it is something to keep in mind. Uh, our security model here is to do the best we can. Uh, we're not going to be perfect at protecting all your secrets. I, I mean, the only way to do that is to keep the computer off. Um, so yeah. And uh, the next kind of really big thing we want to work on is uh, encryption layering. Because uh, right now, uh, double encryption is slow. And this is kind of an issue that comes up with system, uh, with Home D, uh, where people will say, well, we want to encrypt the rootFS. And then on top of the encrypted rootFS, we're having these loopback files that are also encrypted. Encryption on top of encrypt encryption just gets exponentially slower. Uh, but there's this feature in the Linux kernel called uh, block crypto, uh, also known as inline encryption. Uh, basically, this is uh, a feature in hardware on some uh, ARM devices. Usually, your Android phone will have this implemented, actually. Um, and it's basically a crypto accelerator that sits in line between your SOC and uh, your, your storage medium, your flash chip. And uh, the kernel can actually is entirely in control of this crypto accelerator. It can upload keys into there, and uh, it will just transparently encrypt and decrypt data at line speed, so zero performance cost encryption. Um, uh, yeah, and this is not like Opal, which is what x86 has, uh, because Opal is an opaque black box, and in, our, in block crypto, actually, the kernel is entirely in control of the algorithm and the key material, so it could actually just disable the thing and read uh, raw encrypted data straight off the disk and verify that it is actually what it was expecting to be. Um, so, yeah. But we don't have this hardware, but the kernel has a solution. It could actually emulate it in software as well. Um, so it's kind of like DMcrypt at that point. Uh, so why are we even talking about this? Uh, because Android 
has a kernel patch introducing something called DM uh, default key. And basically the way block crypto works is uh, it, whenever anything wants to do an I.O. request, it attaches an encryption context and that goes through uh, the entire layer of file systems, uh, loopback devices, all the way down into the underlying actual block hardware. I mean, that's what it was designed to do. So if we at the bottom put one of these uh, software, um, we, we can put DM default key, basically what it does is anything that doesn't already have an encryption context attached, it will attach a default one. Um, essentially this means we can stack uh, layers of encryption on top of each other and everything that gets uh, encrypted above stays encrypted once with the upper level key all the way down until it gets to disk. But then everything that hasn't been yet encrypted gets encrypted by a layer lower. And we can stack multiple copies of DM default key on top of each other and uh, we can encrypt as many times as we want and this will just work. Uh, so what can we do with this? Um, well, we can have an encrypted root file system and then on top of that we can put home D to encrypt your individual home folders uh, and then when you trigger a secure lock those keys get revoked and that's it, your home folder is no longer readable. Then on top of that we can use FSCrypt uh, to actually encrypt every single one of your Flatpak apps uh, data directories. So then each app gets its own encryption so apps can't go into each other's data or uh, secure apps like Signal maybe or your banking app could actually get their keys revoked even during a normal insecure lock because like your bank doesn't need to run in the background while your phone is locked uh, and your data should not be accessible at that point. Uh, and yeah, and we can do more things. Uh, we can do uh, like uh, Lux kind of secure folder, like Android has the secure folder functionality, we could do that as well. Uh, uh, but there's issues. Um, Google tried to upstream this and they got uh, laughed out of the room. Uh, they, basically they, they were told it's a layering violation uh, but they didn't, they didn't actually try to upstream this the way you'd think. Uh, they actually went into DMcrypt and they hacked up DMcrypt to have uh, this functionality and the kernel people did not like that at all. Um, and Google just kind of gave up on that and now they're just still maintaining it as a downstream patch. Um, they never actually tried to upstream DM default key and uh, there's some grumblings on the uh, crypt setup mailing list that actually this would be accepted potentially into the kernel if, if just as is. Um, we don't know the performance of uh, the software emulation versus DM crypt. It might be very slow. I mean if the hardware is available it will be faster. If we're stacking encryption it will be faster but if there's just a one layer we don't know. And the data is only encrypted once on disk. I don't know if that has any repercussions. It might. Uh, like your home directory will be encrypted with a different key than um, you know, the system. All right. Uh, I'm going to thank uh, STF and the GNOME Foundation and uh, Sonny and Tobias who got me the grant and Leonard for Home D and all the reviewers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And I already see one question. Um, this is awesome, and I like the the, the, the the final stuff about the layout encryption thing. But what what I do wonder about is like I would always assume at least for the upper two layers, like FS crypt for the for the flatback stuff and home D, that the encryption keys would probably be the combined one, right? Like you hash them together and actually. Yeah, I looked into this. Um, it's not easy to do, basically. Uh, just the way the way this hardware works is they'll have like a limited number of slots in the hardware for, for keys and the kernel will basically be just managing that resource however it can and just the way it's implemented in the kernel it's, it's very difficult to mix key material together like that. That would be the best thing, right? Yeah, I agree it would be, yeah. So you mentioned um, the potentially pathological case around the compaction of the uh, home directory data to bring it back to a more reasonable storage format. Mm -hmm. Is there any work to amortize that work earlier in the process to make the pathological case much less likely in the sense of you could be prepping basically to have the haircut of yeah. the space? Um, this was my original solution uh, that I was thinking of. So it would be a, a kernel feature for ButterFS to just continuously be defragmenting itself whenever it can. 
Um, that's an alternate approach, uh, but the ButterFS uh, developer person I spoke to seemed to like the other approach better. Okay, and the other question I had is, uh, are there any takes uh, or any attempts to encrypt the actual storage and memory itself um, using any hardware or software support so that rather than having to actually set the memory to zero the, out that data, that you could simply discard the key? Uh, yeah, that's a possible solution, but uh, I think uh, it's not like a baseline feature that people's laptops would have. Uh, maybe in 10 years it will be, but so I don't know. Maybe this is just not really a problem and it'll fix itself. And Sadly, this is all the time we have for questions right now, but for sure Adrian is going to answer uh, your questions after he uh, he left the room outside so we can uh, continue with the next talk here. So please give another uh, warm welcome to Adrian.